Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tessa Whistlow, and I am Assembly Chairs of Ways and Means. Welcome to the Housing and Social Services Mock Budget Hearing. I'm co-chairing this hearing with Senate Finance Chair Kaylin Vasquez, who will now make a few brief remarks. Thank you, Chairwoman, and thank you for everyone participating. In a moment, we're going to begin calling witnesses. Each witness will have three minutes to make an opening statement. Uh, we will keep track of your time up here and let you know when to stop. After your opening statement, each recognized member will have three minutes to ask any questions that they may have. And with that, Chairman Whistler will now introduce the Assembly members. Thank you. We are joined by Assembly members Fahim Ahmed, Abbas Bey, Michaela Deaton, Lisa Iboibe, Ariana Fizel, Ariana Fizel, apologies, Matea Kalner, Amira Mohammed, and Molly Rosie. Okay, so our first witness is Mariella Frias, and she's with the Division of Housing and Community Renewal. Once you're ready, you may begin your testimony. Your time won't start till then. Good afternoon, chairpersons and members of the Senate and the Assembly. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Mariella Frias, and I've been working as a senior vice president for the Division of Community Renewals um, for the last 13 years. Our organization is responsible for the supervision and maintenance and development of affordable to moderate income housing. The housing climate in the state is critical. People are struggling daily to make ends meet and keep a roof over their heads. There are 74,000 people experiencing homelessness in New York State. That means that there are 74,000 people that we are failing to help. The stories I have heard had led me here today to testify and urge the governor to maintain the $776 million budget from fiscal year 2023 to 2024. This increase in funding is crucial for alleviating the housing climate in the state, as it will allow us to provide an increase in funding for affordable housing programs. Accessible affordable housing is essential for our citizens to be able to keep a roof over their heads while also being able to afford other life necessities. The housing budget for this fiscal year has experienced a $367 million budget cut, which is unacceptable. There are 275,000 families that are on a waiting list to receive housing in New York City. That $367 million could go towards helping families receive a stable place to live. Increasing the housing budget to $776 million could, increase, could create more affordable, more affordable housing opportunities and could help re repair pre-existing public housing buildings. New York City public housing is in desperate need of this money for renovations. People living in these buildings experience less than favorable conditions such as mold infestations, faulty elevators, and leaky pipes. 400,000 people in the city alone rely on public housing to afford a place to live, and it is our job to make sure that their housing is up to code and safe. I just want to preface that this money is not nearly enough to fix the housing crisis. Public housing in New York City has been neglected for the last 44 years and has accumulated $80 billion worth of repairs. It is easy for, to forget that these numbers and statistics are real people, but I'm here to remind you that these are not just numbers on the page. These are real people with real stories, and real struggles. We need this increase in funding to get 275,000 families in New York City off of a waiting list for a place to live. It will allow public housing programs to make necessary repairs to their buildings to make them livable and safe. And most importantly, we'll be able to create more public housing across the state. Our people are struggling and they need our help. And I, I urge you, our elected officials and the governor, to increase the housing budget so that our citizens can have a better future in our state. Thank you for your time, thank you for listening, and I look forward to working with you all in the future. Thank you. I now recognize Assembly Member Fahim Ahmed for three minute questioning. Thank you for your testimony, thank you, Chair. How will you manage to distribute money amongst individuals? Like, will it be based on how much they require assistance? Will individuals apply to receive funding in the forms of a grant? Please elaborate. Um, so the goal is to distribute the money between the different public housing um, organizations in New York City. So there people can apply to these different programs to obtain um, a grant or some sort of assistance that they're looking for. Okay. 
Will you be collaborating with tenant protection programs to make sure the safety of those in public housing to be secure and household? So there's already a tenant protection program in place, um, and it makes sure that uh, landlords know that they're know their rights and tenants also know their rights um, when it comes to rent and rent regulation laws. There are three different um, units of the TPU, um, the audit and invest investigatory unit, the legal unit, and the forensic analysis unit, and they work together in protecting the tenants. Okay. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. And I recognize Assembly Member Lisa Iboybe for three-minute questioning. First and foremost, I would like to say thank you to the chair and thank you for voicing this concern. Housing inequity has been a growing epidemic, and so I would just like to thank you. Um, I will start off by asking this question to address this. How would this apply to the incarcerated population, being that a good amount of them are in need of housing? So NYCHA specifically uh, offers a re-entry program for people who have recently been released from incarceration, and they help families reunite and kind of like reintegrate themselves back into society. And it's, I believe it's two years or something that they're allowed to live in public housing. Okay. Thank you. My next question is, how would these funds be allocated to ensure that they are directly invested into communities in need? So public housing in New York City is already established in underfunded and low-income areas. So this money is directly going to those uh, public housing organizations. So NYCHA, Michelama Project, Section 8, like the, the money is dedicated to them. No further questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Our next witness is Michelle McCarthy. She's the Director for Housing Justice for All. And please take your time. Your time won't start um, until you're ready. Good afternoon, honorable members of the assembly, and thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Michelle McCarthy and I'm the Director of Housing Justice for All, a statewide coalition made up of over 80 individual organisations advocating for tenants and those experiencing homelessness. Our work has resulted in the passing of a multitude of laws, all ensuring New Yorkers have access to safe and secure housing. I'm here today to request that the, leg the legislature allocate an additional $10 million to the Division of Housing and Community Renewal. The executive budget only allocates $419.3 million towards the Division of Housing, serving as a $357.3 million cut from the last year's allocated funding. This is a nearly 46% difference. To cut the funding for the Division of Housing in nearly half is unacceptable, especially when the legislature recognises the housing crisis is becoming increasingly worse. I acknowledge that this cut in funding is primarily due to the elimination of one-time appropriations for several housing assistance initiatives, including the end of pandemic-era federal support. However, this does not justify our state funding reflecting the same cuts being made federally. While the broader economy has recovered from the global pandemic, not every New Yorker has experienced that economic recovery equally or as quickly. According to the Census Bureau, nearly half of New Yorkers are spending more than 30% of their income on rent, a percentage most experts agree is too high to maintain in addition to living costs. This places a huge financial burden on thousands of residents. New York consistently ranks in the top 10 states with the largest homeless population. While the figure fluctuates, the official percentage of people experiencing homelessness in New York is currently 37.7%. The current level of homelessness in New York City alone are the highest levels recorded since the Great Depression. A lack of affordable housing options forces low-income families to spend all their income on rent, causing other issues such as food insecurity to arise as a result. A lack of housing and disposable income can lead to desperation, eventually forcing people to engage in illegal activities that they would otherwise not engage in. Fixing the housing crisis might come at a high cost now, but in the long term, Finding a solution now will save the state immense amounts of money and energy in the future before the problem gets worse. Investing in housing is investing in New York's future. There are a number of state-funded initiatives that can make a positive change possible, but in order for these services to be available to those who need them, then they need funding. 
programmes such as the Emergency Rental Assistance Programme and the, the Homeless Housing Assistance Corporation desperately need increased funding so that they can provide their vital services to the growing number of struggling New Yorkers. The Division of Housing and Community Renewal needs the additional $10 million in funding to do the same. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to provide testimony today. Thank you. And I recognize Assembly Member Matea Colner for three minute questioning. Thank you for your testimony. I'm sure that everyone's districts are feeling the effects of this housing crisis. I just have a couple questions for you. Um, where did you get the homelessness in New York City compared to the Great Depression statistic? And could you provide more information? No problem. Of course, calculating the exact percentage of the homeless population can be difficult given the transient nature of the population. However, the statistics I used for, from the Coalition for Homelessness, who rely on public data sources for statistics about New York City's homeless population. These data sources record the nightly number of homeless people residing in municipal ho homeless shelters, as well as unduplicated number of different people utilize municipal homeless shelters each year. I'd be happy to send our data on to your office if, after the hearing if you'd like any further information on that. Thank you. And then, how does the organization in charge of managing these funds dictate where to allocate their money? Um, of course, I actually work for Housing Justice for All, and I'm advocating for an increase in funding for the New York State Division of, of Housing and Community Renewal. I'm not actually involved in the decision-making process. I do know that they work with both private and public organisations to create safe and affordable housing. They usually allocate the money to municipalities or local regions that would then distribute it to those in need. Thank you so much. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. I now recognize Assembly Member Ariana Fiesel for three minute questioning. Thank you, Michelle, for your testimony. Um, and thank you for advocating for this issue. Um, my first question is, could you further elaborate on the economic benefits that you mentioned in your testimony particularly how allocating additional funds to housing programs could benefit the economy and even help with issues such as food insecurity. In some cases where rent is too high, families are forced to make decisions between providing shelter for their children or providing food. The less of their income people are spending on rent, the more disposable income they have, which can be spent on other necessities like groceries or on other goods and services, which is putting money back into the local businesses and the local economy further stimulating the economy then. Thank you. Um, I have another question. Um, in your opinion, what are long-term solutions that you recommend to address the housing and increased homeless population in New York besides the allocation of funds? There are a number of different possible solutions to addressing the housing crisis. I think that New York needs to learn from other countries' examples, like Denmark, where less than 1% of the population experience homelessness. New York needs to invest in social housing. A recent survey from, the, from Progressive Survey conducted in May 2023 found that 60% of New York voters prefer social, prefer social housing over the free market strategy, which is currently being employed. It's ultimately up to the legislature to decide which path they believe is best for the voters. Thank you. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. McCarthy. Our next witness is Starlin Polanco Rojas, and he is the Director for Human Services at Lawyers United. And you may begin whenever you're ready. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all these assembly members that have taken time out of their day to come meet with me. To introduce, my no introduce myself, my name is Stalin Polanco Rojas and I'm the Director of Human Services here at Lawyers United based in Manhattan, New York. It is important to understand that everyone that lives in New York wants to be heard, but how can we do that when we're saying something and not saying something? 
The discrepancies that adolescents experience behind bars will be incredibly more evident under Bill A00667, an act to change the executive statute regarding the authorities and duties of the Correctional Association to inspect residential juvenile facilities. Under the name Prison Legal Services, the agency will interview young individuals, examine their records, look into complaints, and above all, fight for their safety and rights. But in order to finish their mission, they will require funds. That is why I'm here to show support to the $31 million budget for the upcoming fiscal year. In the upcoming fiscal year, the proposed budget of $31 million will be focusing on the expenses and services related to juvenile justice, crime reduction, crime analysis, and research. As it exists right now, the system is broken. However, many lives can be saved if the money is rightfully allocated. I frequently, frequently like to quote John Green as he's once said, there is hope even when one's mind says otherwise. The intention behind this was not only to encourage, but to inspire people to work towards change. That is why I beg you all to fight for the rights of the prisoners because even after they're freed, the public still oppose them due to various stereotypes, parole restrictions, and financial hardships. Even when it comes down to race, it goes as far as to damage the mentality for almost every person of color that has been incarcerated at a young age. Compared to their white counterparts, black and other kids of color are detained substantially at higher rates in detention facilities. Numerous testimonials and research studies highlight the negative effects and bad habits that are developed within incarceration. In his paper, Why Youth Incarceration Fails, Richard Mendel indicates that high rates of rearrest, convictions, and reincarceration frequently befall youth released correctional confinement. Longer jail terms are associated with higher rates of re recidivism. Initial incarceration raises the risk that young people will become entangled in the criminal justice system. I appreciate each and every member of the, of the assembly that have given me their time of the day and allowed me to talk about such an important topic that's happening right in front of our eyes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now recognize Assembly Member Michaela Deaton for three minute questioning. Thank you for your testimony. My first question is, how do you plan to reduce the incarceration rate for juveniles, especially colored youth with those funds? Because as you stated, compared to white counterparts, black and other kids, and other kids of color are detained substantially higher rates in the detention facilities. The issue that arises is the misconception that minority groups don't need help once incarcerated or released. Minority groups are the ones that are experiencing more trauma, abuse, and suffering more in the outside world. Us as a community, we have to protect our future Black, Latinx, Asian, Middle Eastern, and various different minority groups that are not receiving the attention they deserve. From what I'm able to gather with the organization called Prisoners Legal Services that are under the Bill A00667, the idea is to communicate with juveniles and to show effort to understanding their struggles because they have to understand that there is someone outside that understands them and sees them. With the funds that proposed but plan is to help a child that is arrested to be brought to my organization to assist them with court tribulations, but in the instance where they are arrested, my organization will work hand in hand with prisoner legal services to ensure that their rights are not being violated inside nor with the restrictions that are put on them with parole. Thank you. And do you believe that parents may play a role into why youth are getting wrapped up in the criminal justice field and being incarcerated? I do believe that parents have a part to play since they are the ones that see their child every single day, sunrise to sunset. But as a parent, you can only do so much. Once a child is set out to go to school, they're gonna be influenced by many people around them, no matter how hard you try to fight that. Parents can be in the dark, the dark on what activities their child are taking part in, and in the parent's mind, they could be feeling like they're doing the right thing. They feel like they could do the right path for the child. Communication, activism, and assistance is what is needed to save juveniles from themselves and those around them. No further questions. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize Assemblymember Molly Rossi for three-minute questions. 
Thank you, Chairwoman. I just wanted to say thank you, Director, for being here. I wanted to start off by just applauding you and your organization for the work that you are doing for these kids. My first question was, can you elaborate a little bit more on the crime reduction that you had mentioned, such as what the metric to measure the reduction is and what kinds of programs are involved with this? Alongside the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, certain programs will be already in place with funding. And programs such as Improving Youth Defense, a program dedicated to improving the services already in place. But first and foremost, the priority is the prisoner's legal services under the Bill A00667. It will be a crucial step to figuring out the issue and receiving input from those who are experiencing it firsthand. But if there are still funds and support, another funds and support, another program that comes to mind will be a post-release program that is called aftercare program. It will be focusing on the struggles of employment, housing searching, restrictions on parole, and also family. Okay, and then that also goes into my next question. Even though it was not explicitly mentioned in your testimony, is the reintegration process into society for these adolescents also a part of your organization and just a part of what the proposed budget would go towards? It most definitely is a sense that we have professionals with connections and different offices that can offer employment, assisted housing, educational assistance outside as well. The funds that will be allocated to post release will be around 10 to $15 million if there is that after the bill is passed and with the proposed budget. But our biggest priority is to help those that are first-hand concerned that are not receiving that help. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. And I recognize Assemblymember Ariana Fizo for three-minute questioning. Thank you, Starlin, for your testimony and advocating for juveniles, specifically um, children of color as well. Um, my first question is, can you explain specific programs and services that prisoners' legal services will provide if funded? Prisoners' legal services will be a state-funded program that will be focusing on ensuring that the rights of the inmates are respected while also providing medical, educational, and psychological assistance. With the four goals of investigating, advocating, litigating, and educating, prisoner legal services will have the right funds to allocate to each goal while also worrying about the bigger picture. Thank you. Um, my second question is, how will your agency ensure that the rights of young people, including due process and fair treatment, are protected during the, during the services? I do want it to be known that Every case is going to be different, no matter how could it be. It could be a homicide case, it could be a child abuse case, it could be various different cases, but the overall idea is that each inmate or arrestee will have a lawyer and try to ensure that their rights are respected. And alongside the already in place attorney, there'll be a counsel with the experience of aiding lawyers in groups dedicated to minorities, since in the justice system, it is already shown that it's a broken system when it comes to race and racism. So there will be a counsel in aiding the lawyer, giving legal advice, the right steps, and that could be to include, include lowering the sentence or being set free. Thank you for further elaborating on that. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. I now recognize Assemblymember Matea Kalner for three-minute questioning. Thank you so much, Director, for being with us today in your testimony. My first question is, how will the organization decide what juvenile offender cases to review specifically within those minorities? With prison legal services, the juveniles will be informed that this is for their protection and for all the, inform and all the information provided will be confidential. It is a form to hold those that are wrongfully hurting and abusing their power accountable. I would also ask the warden at the juvenile center to speak with the juveniles privately and to ensure that the juveniles understand that they're allowed to speak freely. But I do want to reiterate that if the juveniles do not feel comfortable in participating, they have the right to not participate. All right, and a follow-up question to that. What does the organization do if they believe something improper or even criminal has occurred against the juvenile that is incarcerated? Once prison and legal services have factual evidence that there's an improper use of power, a case will be opened against the juvenile system, holding the warden and each official to pay for their crimes. To provide support to the inmate that is experiencing trauma, they will either have receive a shorter sentence, financial support for them or their loved ones, or can negotiate whatever needs they require. 
Thank you for answering my questions and for your testimony once again. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. And I recognize Assembly Member Abe Boss for three minute questioning. Thank you and good evening, Starlin. Um, you said co compared to their white counterparts, black and other kids of color are detained at substantially higher rates in detention, detention facilities. Um, do you think this is due to systemic racism or due to bad communities or because they just want to do bad things? What is your input on that? Sincerely, I do not believe that teenagers want to do bad things. Again, as I said before, people could be influenced by those around them. Um, it could definitely be the idea of trying to be cool or fit with the crowd, quote unquote. But it seems to me like it's a cry for help. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing battle against institutional and systemic racism, both locally and nationally. I want to bring that out there. It's New York and all other states as well. The younger generation merely needs to be led in the correct direction, in my opinion. And it's also knowing that they have support. But how can we have, show that they have the support when the system that's dedicated to protecting them is the one doing the most harm? Well put. Um, my second question for you is, why is it that longer jail terms are associated with higher rates of recidivism? Great question. Um, there is a number of reasons for this, but the most common one I've observed is that released prisoners believe that it's already challenging to make a living because of all the limitations and preconceptions that the system has already created. The fact that once released, you have a parole officer that's giving you time constraints, a curfew, housing restrictions, and even, that's not even talking about employment as well, with the idea that you have to notify your employer if you have been in prison or not. This is already creating an environment where they feel like the only way to provide for them or their loved one, loved ones, sorry, is to go back to the crime life and go back to pursuing that, such as events like drug dealing, which is a way of income, even though it is illegal, it's a way to provide for those that have their loved ones. And if they can't do it legally, they're gonna have to feel like they have to do it illegally because the system is already not working for them. It's very unfortunate when they have to do that. Um, my, my last question for you is, you quoted John Green, there is hope when one mind, one's mind says otherwise. Uh, my question to you is, do you know any other quote by him, by heart? And if so, what is it? Because it was a good quote. John Green is an amazing author. As uh, many of you guys know, he is the author of The Fallen Off Stars. And a quote that comes to mind is, I do not know a perfect person. I only know flawed people that are trying to work on themselves. That's a quote dedicated to people that are just trying to focus on themselves, but how can they help themselves when they're showing, that, showing everyone around them, especially people in higher positions, that they're needing for help, they need the assistance, and people are turning a blind eye and focusing on other issues. We have to help those that are in need, especially children who don't even have their own voice yet. Thank you, no further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next witness is Ariana Reyes, the Director of New York City Housing Preservation and Development. And please take your time. Uh, you can start your testimony whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, assembly members and senators. I appreciate you all for allowing the time before you to speak about the housing crisis I'm sure all of your constituents have made your office aware of. My name is Ariana Reyes. I'm the director of New York City's Department of Housing Preservation and Development. I'm in front of you today in hopes of convincing you to allocate funds to turn the corner on this dire issue. We are asking for $120,000 from the Homeowner Stabilization Fund to be allocated for a tax credit incentive for landlords who rent stabilize their units. In addition, we are requesting $3 million to expand existing rent assistance programs and to create programs similar to the Michelle Alama program, which are more resistant to privatization. Prior to being an advocate and director of the department, I used to be an attorney for the Manhattan District's office. I was there for five years witnessing the struggles New Yorkers go through committing petty and nonviolent 
crimes out of the necessity for survival in our financial economy. Many low income families and working class have to choose between paying rent over having a meal, heating their homes, and keeping the lights on. No one should have to decide between their basic needs and having a roof over their heads. My office performed a study on, based on the census done in 2023 known as the New York City Housing Vacancy Survey. We found that New York City currently has the most vacant units since we started this survey in 1965. There are 61,000 vacant units since 2021. Be that as it may, the thousands of apartments that are available aren't even affordable nor realistic for the working class, let alone anyone at the poverty line. In 2023, the median rent for all rentable units was $1,641. This is nine, a 9% 9 increase on top of a 10.2% increase in inflation. If a person is paid minimum wage bi-weekly, working a total of 80 hours, their monthly salary is only $992. The current New York City average rent is almost 139.6% above the minimum wage income. This goes to show that the housing issue in this city, in this state, is way bigger than the number of homes needed. It is more about making sure families are able to pay their rents and mortgages than anything else. We urge you to look at the people that need your di direct assistance. If this money is allocated to programs such as Section 8, SHRE, and even the ERF, renters may be able to fill the gap between what is already out of their reach and what is attainable for the middle class and low income based constituents. I and the people of New York thank you for your time today and urge you to allocate these funds to help start fixing these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now recognize Assembly Member Abbas Bay for three minute questioning. Thank you and good evening. You said that there was an increase in 61,000 vacant units in New York City since 2021. Do you think that this was an increase because of COVID or what, what is your input on that? I can't fully t uh, testify to why they fully increased. However, I don't believe COVID was the main cause as the 10.2 increase in inflation that I stated within my testimony occurred within the last two years. COVID started in 2020 and these inflation crisis that affected New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania began increasing extensively within 2021. Well said. Um, my second question for you is, why do you think that inflation has gotten so bad in New York City? Why is it that inflation has risen that people can't pay the rent in New York City? I'm not necessarily an expert on the financials, um, financial expertise, nor am I able to um, analyze the um, economy itself. I, however, I can testify to the fact that the cost of living and its expenses, including food, um, clothes and things of that nature all have risen. Inflation, once again, has increased extensively in the last two years with everything that is increasing. Once again, food, clothing, rent, minimum wage has stayed stagnant at 15%. It has not been able to attest for all the other increases, nor are we able to continue to afford those increased expenses. Thank you. And my final question for you is, you said you are requesting $30 million to expand existing rent assistance programs. Do you think $30 million is too small of a number to assist the New Yorkers with rent, as, with rent assistance? Why not $200 million or something like that? In an ideal world, we would ask for $200 million. However, we're asking for a start on fixing this program. $30 million is a slight dent into what we can do, but it is a start, and it is the most realistic start that we can attest to um, include, to help afford these expenses for our New York City residents. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize Assembly Member Molly Rossi for three-minute questioning. Thank you, Chairwoman, again. Uh, thank you, Director, for coming out today and talking about this issue. This is a problem that I am very, very familiar with, as this is a major problem that's currently ongoing in my district that I serve. Uh, I was just wondering, do you or the department have an estimate of how many uh, programs the $30 million would go towards or even how many households it will end up helping? Yes, we do. If we um, take a look at the number of 
residents who are in NYCHA um, housing, that is 360,970 residents just within that one program alone. And if all of the money is at least allocated to that one program, it would allow each, an, each individual family 83 to $100 each month, which can be a, an expensive um, aid to whether or not they are able to pay their rent or keep any necessities at all. Okay. And then can any rent assistance programs apply for the requested $30 million, or are there certain criteria that they have to meet beforehand? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, for the rent assistance programs, when you get, if you get the requested $30 million, do any of the programs need to meet certain criteria beforehand, or can anyone apply for that? No, any of the rent assisted programs, such as Section 8, 3, the ERF, are allowed to um, get some of these funds, and any other necessary programs that can attest for other populations can uh, request for $30 million as well. All right, and then for my last question, the Mitchell Lama program, as you had mentioned, it was created in the 70s, so wouldn't it make more sense to expand and put more funds into that and other already existing programs, as you had mentioned in your testimony, that we know work and can function rather than trying to create a whole new program to address the same issues? I would say no, as the Michelle Lama program, um, it was come set at a halt. A lot of the, the buildings and the units were turned towards privatization due to a few bills that legislation was trying to pass, including the Rent Act of 2011, which actually was passed in June of 2011. While it didn't specify the Michelle Lama program, a lot of the units and a lot of the homeowners and landlords that are were a part of the Michelle Lama Lama program turned towards privatization as it heavily halted the benefits of the program itself. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. I now recognize Assembly Member Lisa E. Boybe for three minute questioning. Thank you, Chair. First and foremost, I would like to thank you for being a voice for those who are suffering from housing insecurities. Um, my question is how, would, how could this benefit our housing crisis? It can benefit our housing crisis by, once again, bridging that gap from what renters are able to afford based on their minimum wage or based on any sort of low monthly income that they do attain to actually what is presented. With all the units that are available, none of them are affordable. Affordability within our state is between 28 and 30 percent of, uh, of someone's income. And like I said, the, the average rent in, um, income the average rent in New York City is 139.6% above someone's minimum income. So having this money allocated to these programs would allow an assistance in that and making it more affordable. Thank you. My next question is this. I fear that this may reduce the incentives for landlords to invest into my district and to repair um, and develop building units. How would this impact landlords? There's two ways that landlords could be impacted, whether it be through the creation of a new and improved Michelle Alama program. The Michelle Alama program incentivizes for homeowners and landlords to make their units more rent stabilized as they would get benefits, whether it's tax incentives or um, programs and facilities and grants that they are allowed to apply for to help upkeep their buildings and things of that nature. So that is one way. A second way is with the 120,000 tax credit, each landlord dependent on their situation, whether it's the number of apartments, buildings, number of units that they hold, will allow will be allocated a specific amount of credits that they are allowed to qualify for. And they can apply for those credits and use the money that they get back from that to go to push back into their buildings. It's, so whether or not they do it on their own or do it towards a new program, they, and if as long as their their units are rent stabilized, they are able to get some sort of benefit. Thank you, and that leads me to my last question. You mentioned that one hundred twenty thousand dollars would be invested into landlords who rent stabilize their units. However, three million is being contributed to those in rent assistant programs. Do you believe that this should be more balanced to provide landlords with the finances to upkeep their units? The, the difference of offset is because a lot more people are reliant on these rent assistance programs than the number of landlords that are there. A lot of them are program-based or things of that nature. But with that, with that 120000 tax credit, it will hopefully allow them to use the funds that they do get back from their taxes to reinvest into their buildings. And as well as if this $30 million is allocated to these renters who need assistance, it would allow them, the landlords, to have their payments 
be made on time and be made in full. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Reyes. Thank you. Our next witness is Laura Rojas. She is the Senior Policy Advisor for Tenants and Neighbors. As for everyone, your time will begin when you're ready. Good afternoon, chairs and other honorable members of the legislature. My name is Laura Rosas, and I am the senior policy advisor at Tenants and Neighbors, a 50-year-old organization that works across New York State to build tenant power. The housing crisis in, that New York State is facing is not one that has occurred overnight. Rather, it's one that, happened, that has happened because of systemic divestment and disregard to the state's most vulnerable populations. Renters make up nearly half of the households in New York State. And while data may be showing that income is on the rise in the state, a majority of the residents in New York State continue to be rent burdened. New York State needs to begin investing in its communities and commit to help ensuring low-income New Yorkers are able to stay in their homes. The lack of supply in housing, particularly affordable housing, has led to skyrocketing rents and has left many tenants and families unable to pay their rents. This is why I come before you today to ask for an increase in funding to the Family Homelessness and Eviction Program. My ask consists of two things. Currently, the program only serves families that have either, uh, that are currently homeless or are undergoing eviction. This is affecting the mental and physical well-being of these families. With an increase in funding and an amendment of language, the program could help families before they even have to begin the eviction process. The government's budget currently proposes no protections for tenants living in unregulated units who face unreasonable rent hikes. An increase in broadening in funding would help provide rent insecure families the safety net that New York State has yet to provide them with. Growing up, evictions were the norm. At lunch, we would make jokes about, how, about who would be the next one of us to be uprooted from the community because as children, we did not have the words to express the fears and anxieties that eviction causes. The stories of my peers and I are not unique. Rather, it is the very real reality of hundreds of thousands of children's and families that are currently housing insecure and are only payments away from being served eviction notices. I am asking you all to please invest in New York and invest in a future where families are able to stay in their homes and access state funding that would allow them to settle roots in their communities. It is time we stop letting tenants risk their stability for the sake of profits. Housing is a human right, it is a human dignity, and I hope this governing body will take the opportunity to protect that right for every New Yorker. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. I now recognize Assemblymember Fahim Ahmed for three minute questioning. Thank you, Ms. Chair, and thank you for your testimony. I have some few questions for you. How much are you asking in support for this program? So according to a study done by the Community Service Society, um, in order to fully fund the program, so including the expansion uh, to include families that are also housing insecure, we would need a total of $1.72 billion. But um, uh, how the language is currently written, local municipalities and city, and city governments also fill a large part of that bill. So right now, what we're currently asking is for an additional $250 million to dedicate to this first wave of inclusion for housing insecure renters. I see. <clears throat> My second question. Yesterday, this program helps families, but does it also help individuals and households? So currently, the way the program is written, it is only open to families. And while in an ideal world, everybody um, who does need the funding would be able to access funding, the way the system is set up, um, it is only allowable to families because one of the requirements is that a person in that household be under the age of 18 and be receiving cash assistance. I see. My final question, how would this program clarify that the right families who need the help receive the help rather than helping families who do not require such assistance? So I think it's a very big common misconception amongst a lot of people that 
um, people try to, there's hordes of people trying to take advantage of state welfare programs. Um, it's definitely not a situation that can be completely avoided, and I can understand the causes for concern when it comes to ensuring that the funding is going to the people that it's intended for. But I think with rigorous training and staff and caseworkers that aren't overworked and are able to actively engage with the people that they're meant to help serve, you're more likely to not have any pitfalls in that kind of overview system. I see. Thank you very much. No further questions. Thank you. And I recognize Assemblymember Michaela Deaton for three-minute questioning. Thank you. My first question is, do you know if there's any limitations to receiving the state funding? For instance, say one does not have a job and they are evicted. How does providing more funds to the home, family homelessness and eviction program make sure people aren't evicted again? And do you know if they'll make sure that there's a job present so they're not taking advantage of state funding or not? So um, currently the requirements for the program, they don't have any citizen requ citizenship um, requirements and along with that, the main two requirements is that the household contain a child that is either 18 or younger and that that child receive cash assistance. Along with the cash assistance aspect, in order for the child to qualify, there is no um, necessary uh, requirement that the adult in the household have a job. Um, the program doesn't offer any job services. Um, one way that to help address your issue is that families are allowed to fill out the application um, at job centers, which again um, opens up the accessibility to those kinds of services. Thank you. And my second question is, will the state funding increase also provide basic need assistance as well, being that they are low income and can't afford rent most of the time, and they're probably struggling with basic needs, is there funding to help with that as well? Um, yeah, absolutely. Currently, the way that the program is written, um, it's specifically the money that um, is set aside for any particular family is given directly to the landlord. But what that also does is it frees up money in a family's budget to start dedicating into other things such as health insurance, food, things like that. And since um, in order to be allowed into the program, the child does have to be, the child in the family does have to be receiving cash assistance. That also go, goes to other things that wouldn't necessarily be covered by other fed, um, government funded programs such as um, utilities or basic necessities. Okay, thank you. And my last question is, can you just briefly elaborate on how the funding increase to the family homelessness and eviction program benefits you? Um, I think me particularly, I've thankfully moved out of a place where I would need to access any kind of funding like that. But what I will say is it does help children that were in my place, particularly not knowing if you had somewhere to go home at night is something that's very traumatic. It's something that destabilizes a child. And so knowing that an increase in funding would allow more children to not have to go through that same kind of trauma does soothe something in me. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. I now recognize Assemblymember Amira Muhammad for three-minute questioning. Thank you, Senior, for your testimony. My first question is, how would the funds be divided between the pre-existing program and the new program? So, absolutely. So, currently, the program in the governor's proposed budget is funded at $100 million. Since I'm proposing an additional $250 million, I ask that or I would hope that these $250 million be set aside directly in order to start filtering and um, accepting applications for families that are um, rent insecure. My second question is because you are focusing on two different situations, um, which one would be prioritized first, the homeless or the people that's on the brink of eviction? No, yeah, absolutely. Um, so. Because the program has already been in set in a while, it first came about um, in 2020 when the um, COVID-19 pandemic started, there is already set infrastructure to um, go over and receive applications from um, families that are currently afflicted or experience homelessness. So this would require a new dedication of staff. Um, and a partial um, side dedication of administration from the funding in order to start um, doing these applications. But I think that it definitely should not detract from the good progress that this uh, program is already doing. 
Okay. Um, my last question is, you previously stated that trauma of eviction affects the mental well-being of families. So how are you going to combat that? And are there funds that you're possibly getting out of the budget that will go towards the mental health of families? Um, so currently, Tenants and Neighbors is not, um, has not received confirmation of whether we would be receiving government funds to help with the um, resources that our organization offers. And since we do primarily focus on building tenant power, we don't currently have any programs that serve the trauma that comes with being um, involved in the eviction process. But one of the great things about being um, a nonprofit in New York State is that everyone knows each other and everyone is very highly connected. And since we are on the steering committee of one of the major housing campaigns in New York State, we are a part of a big referral system where if tenants do come to us and say they are experiencing mental health or physical or emotional well-being issues, we are able to refer them out to other nonprofit organizations that do offer therapeutic services to help address those issues. Thank you for your time. No further questions. Thank you. I now recognize Assemblymember Abbas Bay for three-minute questioning. Thank you and good evening. Um, I know that you are asking to increase funding to the Family and Homelessness and Eviction Program, but how much exactly are you asking for? What is the specific number, if you can, if you can tell me? Yeah, so the specific increase is $250 million, and that would just be for the first wave in expansion. Um, and because the um, fully funded request is definitely well, significantly higher than what we're currently asking for, um, I think it's important to take account the fact that municipalities and their governments also take a burden of the cost with them. Okay. And my second question for you is, you said renters make up nearly half of the households in New York State. But can you give me an exact percentage? Because you said half, so is it like 45? Nearly, you said nearly half. But is it like 45% or so? And how do you know renters make up nearly half of the households in New York State? So um, those, the statistics of half the renters in New York State um, came from the New York Census um, reporter. Uh, and the exact number that our rent uh, burdened is hovers around like 48.6%. But what's important to note about that statistic is the fact that um, being rent burdened is something that um, communities of color are most likely to be afflicted with continuing to just further the systemic racism that's been boundless in our government. Interesting. And my final question to you is, you said the housing crisis New York State is facing is not one formed overnight. Um, can you tell me exactly when did the housing crisis in New York State first start, if you, if you can tell me? Um, so that's a bit more of a difficult question, especially depending on how far you're willing to blame certain or attribute the blame of certain circumstances too, but um, from what I've been able to gather, a lot of it did start in the 1920s to the 1940s when this whole new idea of city expansion began in the United States, particularly in New York State. One of the main things that did occur was the fact that there was the, um, I forget if it's the urban sprawl or the suburban sprawl, but essentially white um, wealthy families of color began fleeing major cities that um, were developing in New York State. And because of that, a lot of these cities started to face a lot of divestment and didn't have the funds for the upkeep of their communities. Um, yeah. Thank you, I have no further questions, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Rojas. Thank you. Our next witness is Stephen Stouter. He is the chairman of the Upstate First Responders Council. Please take your time. Uh, you can begin your testimony whenever you're ready.
Good afternoon, and thank you all for, uh, for being here today to uh, hear my testimony. Uh, my name is Steven Stouter. I am chairman of the Upstate First Responders, uh, First Responders Council and a volunteer firefighter from Tonawanda, New York. I've also worked as an EMT, a 911 dispatcher, and an EMS director for Erie County. I'm here today to advocate for the reallocation of funding from the public safety surcharge, upgrading emergency communication infrastructure, and to address the underfunding of EMS agencies across the state. The public safety surcharge is a tax on landline and cell phone service intended by the original legislation to fund emergency communications networks. Currently, $500 million of the $1.2 billion raised by this surcharge is diverted into the general fund rather than set aside for emergency communication as intended. This diversion results in chronic underfunding of our networks. Many agencies in New York State have to make do with outdated equipment, including telephone switchboards as old as the 1950s. This diversion also renders New York State's uh, first response agencies ineligible for federal NextGen 911 funding. The NextGen 911 program seeks to transition 911 agencies across the country to a more modern internet-based 911 protocol system, which allows better coordination and information sharing between agencies, response units, and callers. The federal government has allocated funding to NextGen 911 grant programs. But states which engage in fee diversion, as described above, are not eligible for these grants. The implementation of NextGen 911 will require an end to the fee diversion and then an additional uh, 3 to $4 billion by the state over the next decade, um, or uh, $400 million this fiscal year. Finally, I'd also like to discuss uh, funding for ambulance services. Currently, these agencies are facing a critical staffing shortage, particularly in rural areas. I'd like to ask the legislature to increase the Medicaid reimbursement rate for ambulance services and to allow Medicaid reimbursement for care rendered at the scene. In an incident, transportation is not always required, but Medicaid does not currently reimburse ambulance services for care rendered at the scene, only when a patient is actually transported to a hospital. Um, this results in uh, medical providers not receiving or the agency's not being paid for care that their providers uh, render at the scene of an incident. Um, reforming this oversight and increasing the reimbursement rate for ambulance services is necessary to ensure adequate funding for these operations. I'd like to restate the request to reallocate the public safety surcharge in conclusion, um, to reallocate it to its intended purpose uh, per the original legislation, and to allocate $400 million to NextGen 911 grants and increase the Medicaid reimbursement rate for ambulance services. I'd like to thank the legislature for taking the time to discuss these pressing issues today. Thank you very much for your testimony. I now recognize Assembly Member Ariana Fizo for three minute questioning. Thank you, Stephen, for your statement. Um, my first question is, how has the continual, continual underfunding affected the responsiveness and efficiency of first responders, taking into consideration the outdated instruments these agencies use regularly? So uh, under, underfunding um, affects the agencies in basically every way. Um, but in particular, uh, the, they, the, these agencies don't have adequate uh, funding in order to, um, to properly staff their services, resulting in longer response times and uh, lower quality of care as we can't provide um, competitive salaries to attract the most, uh, the, the most effective uh, professionals to these positions. Um, outdated communications equipment in particular also means uh, that these agencies can, ha can only handle a smaller volume of callers and can't easily share information between responding agencies leading to more um, uh, reduced uh, f operational um, flexibility. Thank you. My second question is, how do you anticipate the increase in Medicare reimbursement rates for EMT services to remedy the staffing and funding challenges faced by these agencies? So, I mean, the increase in reimbursement rates will uh, improve revenues across the board for these agencies um, and allow them to more effectively uh, reallocate um, their own budgets into uh, staffing and personnel costs, um, which would allow uh, them to hire more, uh, more personnel, more care providers, and also to uh, increase the salaries which they can pay their providers. Thank you. And my last question is, are there any specific cases or incidents 
that you know of that call attention to the immediate need for the proposed budget increase? So, uh, because because it's such a, uh, it's a it is a statewide issue, but to draw attention to a, a specific uh, a specific need, um, the average response time to a nine one one call in New York State is thirteen minutes. However, many areas, especially rural areas upstate, have much higher response times. Um, in particular, uh, up in the Adirondacks uh, in Warren County, um, the response time is almost twenty two minutes. Um, Essex County is up to 25 minutes, and, and Hamilton County, 53 minutes uh, for a response for first responders to arrive at the scene of a 911 call. Um, better staffing, um, better budget allocation to staffing um, will allow agencies to increase coverage and will allow uh, more flexible coverage in, uh, between areas. Um, and as well, better communications means that these agencies can coordinate with each other better, uh, lowering response times in these underserved areas. Again, thank you. Thank you. And I recognize Assembly Member Amira Muhammad for three minute questions. Thank you, Chairman, for your testimony. My first question is You stated that the federal government allocated funding for the new gen 911 programs. Do you know how much the federal government gives? And if so, is it a yearly grant or is it a one time grant? Um, it varies uh, year by year how much the federal government allocates. Um, in uh, 2019, they, uh, the Department of Transportation and the uh, Federal 911 uh, distributed $110 million among 34 states. Um, so it is a while it is a um, additional uh, funding available from the federal government. The primary um, the primary expense is at the state level. My second question is: You said that to fully implement the NG. Um, 911 program, you would need 400 million. What does the 500 million raised by the public safety surcharge go towards? So the, the public safety surcharge uh, currently, um, the, the existing legislation for the public safety surcharge um, breaks down how it is allocated, but the vast majority of the surcharge funding goes to uh, local 911 agencies and to emergency communications. So uh, increasing the uh, increasing the um, or reallocating the public safety surcharge back into uh, public safety purposes would uh, just increase the funds avail available for the existing allocations. Um, so the the uh, the additional real the additional funds from the reallocation would go back into public safety. My last question is: If we were to reallocate you the seven hundred million for the public surcharge revenue and the 400 million for the implementation of the program, you would be at $1.1 billion and that's not including the federal grant um, if we were to terminate the surcharge fee. Um, so you would be nearly at half the amount you're asking for in this year's budget. Why would you need the 400 million each year for the next decade? So the, uh, the federal grant programs are allocated to individual agencies, not to the state. Um, and of course, that's a uh, the the pool of federal money is allocated across every eligible state and every eligible agency within those states. Um, so it, it it would not be a overly significant amount. Uh, so the primary funding would have to come from the state. Um, the the figure the the uh, what what was it two point four billion I believe it was or uh, three to four billion over the next uh, over the next decade. Um, that figure uh, is in addition to the public safety surcharge uh, reallocation. So that that would be that is the necessary funding on on top of the public safety surcharge to fully implement the next gen nine one one program. Thank you for your time. No further questions. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was our last witness. I would like to thank all the members and witnesses for their participation. Before we close, I would like to recognize the Senate's finance chair for closing remarks. Thank you so much, Chairwoman. I also would like to thank all the members and witnesses for coming out today. Uh, this is a very important issue for our state and the passionate testimony from the advocates just underscores that we truly are in a housing crisis and we must act now. So thank you so much. This concludes the hearing. Thank you very much for attending.